Evan, who is the maker of your violin? Uh, so this violin was made by uh, a Dutch maker called Mathieu Besseling. Uh, he lives and works in Amsterdam. Um, it was built for me in 2010. I was living over there at the time and lived pretty close to his studio and um, so I commissioned an instrument from him and was able to, I was able to visit him many times during the uh, months that he was making it so I saw it in, you know, it's very nascent stages where the back was just being carved from a single piece of maple and um, yeah, it was a really wonderful experience to sort of be present for that. and. Work with him. And so when when he was making this instrument for you, did you already have the Baroque set up in mind? It was Yes, this this, this was yes, this was uh -huh. built uh, commissioned and built as a Baroque violin. So wow. yeah. So and the strings are they're all gut. These are gut, so I play on um, unsplit lamb gut, uh, open gut E, A and D, and then the G is gut wound uh, in silver. Um, and that's that's that is basically the historical setup from the time. I mean, people were also playing on open gut G strings uh, in certain uh, geographical areas at certain times. Um, the G, uh, but G's bond and silver were also uh, not rare, fairly common uh, at least uh, beginning at least in the 18th century, if not in, uh, in the late 17th. Um, I have tried playing on open, I have played on open gut a G and it's, it's a challenge. It's not um, the most versatile choice. So like if you're playing a lot of really early music, um, say like 1650 before, it makes sense to play on an open gut G, but if you're playing also like sometimes Mozart, you know, you don't, you don't want to be playing on, a, on an open gut G. So, <laughs> so um, wait, open gut? Open gut, means... so it means it's just raw, I mean it's, it's, uh, treated, but it's raw gut that's t that doesn't have any additions. There, um, so there are also gimped gut strings, which have uh, usually a, some sort of thin copper wire. Um, mm -hmm. uh, some string makers make a gimped D string, and that gives the, the string a just a little bit more uh, uh, core and um, quickness of, of speaking. Um, makes it a little bit more flexible than than the open gut, but. Um, I prefer this setup, but it, it really works for me. A wound G-string? Yes, yeah, wound G-string. It's just going to give you a little bit more precision? A little bit more like? precision, yes. And um, you can also, with an open gut G, like you really have it, it to pretty much change the way you think about uh, making contact with the bow. Um, mm -hmm. You have to so increase your, the bow speed. With the G, you can you can sort of concentrate the weight and dig in mm -hmm. a little bit more, like you would on a even on a steel string. I mean, it's it's still quite different, but the presence of the metal um, gives you that that point of contact that's a little bit more familiar. Can you explain what exactly makes this a Baroque violin? How does this set up different from a modern sure. violin? So I, there are some cosmetic things like no chin rest, no shoulder rest. Um, I do have this little nub of a chamois, um, which is a, a trick that is going around uh, some of my friends, um, which acts as just like a little bit of a, a point of contact. Um, and I find it very comfortable. Um, I have a little little piece of chamois here also for the same reason, just for a little bit of traction. Um, the tailpiece is different, different shape, uh, all wood. Um, the strings, of course. Uh, the bridge is um, has a different carvings. Um, they tend to be a little bit thicker than modern bridges in my experience. Um, and the sloping um, is a little bit um, shallower, so that also makes playing chords a little bit easier just for um, being able to uh, easily um, play more than one string at a time. Mm -hmm. 
the most significant difference is really the angle of the neck and the thickness of the neck. But the angle is pretty much parallel with the shoulders of the instrument. On a modern violin, the neck is, is angled back like this, which places more tension on the strings um, with the neck that's um, more or less flush with the rest of the body. Um, that doesn't exert the same force on the bridge, and so that gives a different timbre to the sound. It's a little bit sweeter, a little bit more mellow. The fingerboard is a bit is shorter. This is not. This is a little bit longer than like a true, uh, let's see, late 17th century um, fingerboard. This is a little bit later, but in Gimignani's treatise, the highest note and the highest note in Bach is also the high A. So m most many. Um, high Baroque violin fingerboards didn't go past the high A, uh, which is the fourth above the, the harmonic on the, the mm -hmm. E string. Because the, the neck is at uh, this parallel angle, to achieve the, the angle of the strings, there's a little wedge that's put in between the finger, fingerboard and the neck, and you can see the slight triangular shape that's, it's, mm -hmm. that's between the two, um, and this nice carving there. Um, and uh, it's a little bit thicker, which gives uh, just a nice tactile sensation in the left hand. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that those are the main, the main differences between a Baroque violin and a modern violin. So is this here, is this where you're putting your chin or...? Well, this is, so Matthew's varnish is sort of notoriously soft. I've known even older instruments to sometimes like bleed onto white concert shirts. Um, this doesn't happen with the, this instrument so much, but other examples I've, I've, I've had colleagues who have his instruments who have had that happen. So w I did a lot of playing on this instrument when it was really new mm -hmm. and so it started to wear down pretty quickly it's stopped now but um this is this is not unusual but mm -hmm. my chin does sort of you know it hovers over there so uh -huh. um Oops. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> your pose i noticed don't you well you have an extra little addition in there i do so well I'll take, so this bow is um the stick is uh modeled after a stick that's in the uh, Instrument Museum in Vienna um, from um, around 1680. Mm -hmm. um, and the frog is, was made by the maker, who is, uh, his name is Thomas Pitt, he's a British uh, cellist living outside of Berlin. Um, and it doesn't have a um, turn screw at the end, um, and, the f and so the frog is, is fixed in place. Um, Meaning that if I want to change the tension, then I would need to insert um, something in between the hair and the frog to uh, regulate the tension. Um, historically, they would have used pieces of leather. Nowadays, um, I've also heard people using matchsticks. Um, people will use pieces of paper. Uh, but a, a colleague, friend of mine, a couple years ago, showed me this trick with a, an elastic, a very non-historical elastic hair tie <laughs> um, that you put it like this. So you loop it around, double loop it around the hair like this, pull it taut, and then loop each, each end around the stick like that. And um, this I find like the most comfortable, because um, with paper sometimes you know, the pieces are not very even or not very um, flush and so you can get sort of irregularities in, in the tension across the hair. This is, this is a really nice um, modern convenience. Um, and this bow, uh, also, also a Baroque uh, bow made by Luis Emilio Rodriguez, uh, who lives in The Hague. Um, 
it's not based on any historical models. Um, this, but this bow is something that we sort of came up together over the course of many conversations. Uh, I wanted something that had um, a much higher arc, arc. And this, I mean, the higher arc is, is sort of a trademark of the Baroque bow, but this, I think one, this is an example that has a more obvious shape. Um, also, this is an interesting um, mechanism. The, the frog is also fixed. Um, but the maker devised a system where there's a, there's a, there's a sort of his own design of a screw that um, pulls the hair, sort of pulls it this way when you tighten it. So um, you can, in fact, loosen the hair with this screw. I can make the, um, the bow shape a little bit more exaggerated. Um, and the advantage of this um, is that with a fixed frog, um, the, the over, just the distribution of the weight within the bow doesn't change when you, when you tighten or loosen the hair, um, as it does with a turn screw, which um, adjusts the location of the frog. Yeah. So, As well as you don't have to work with, as Nelly was doing, the sort of manipulation. You just have to insert your hair tie in. Yeah, that's that. that is that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. Um, and sometimes, you know, if it's a particularly humid day, then it'll, even though I've got it under, you know, this amount of tension, mm -hmm. it'll still feel a little, um, a little flabby and, you know, that's just the way it is. <laughs> this is my short bow. This is the bow that I use yeah, this is just for, me to keep track. for just uh, all of, uh, basically all of Philomena's concerts okay. or, or, or core repertoire concerts. Okay. Other Baroque bow, um, which I will use for our Bach concert. I use okay. it for the like, higher Baroque stuff. I use it for okay. a lot of orchestral stuff. So. So thank you guys all for listening, for watching, and thank you so much to Filament for joining me on this and teaching me a lot because I apparently I did not know that much about Baroque instruments. <laughs> so I hope you guys learned a lot too. Cheers, and if you liked this video, please subscribe, give us a like, give us a thumbs up, leave us a comment, and make sure to go to their concert if you're in Philadelphia. Cheers!